The chair recognizes the Honorable Jeremy Moss. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I am going to take my time, but not as long as some others here, to say goodbye to the Michigan House of Representatives after a very long history here. I first started working in the Michigan House in August of 2005 when I began an internship for Paul Condino, the state representative from Southfield, and my direct supervisor was Paul's legislative director, Erin Shore, who is now the first lady of the city of Lansing. And when Aaron and Andy welcomed in their second child in 2006, I was hired on to fill in her role during her maternity leave. So I was 19 years old, an acting legislative director, making a whopping $10 an hour. I returned to the Michigan House in 2011 as the district director for State Representative Rudy Hobbs of Southfield. And this line of work is tough, and it's very tough to find people that you can trust no matter what, uh, and I'm proud and honored that I've had mentors like Rudy uh, and Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence. And in 2011, later that year, I was elected to serve on the Southfield City Council. Uh, I was 25, the youngest ever member of the Southfield City Council, the youngest member by 30 years, and I served with 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, and the oldest local elected official in the state of Michigan who is 93 years old at the time. When I was elected, one of my colleagues said to me, welcome to the Southfield City Council, where it's like being on a deserted island with six other people and everybody hates everybody else. Another colleague told me on election night when I had won, don't you ever forget you're just 25 years old. A third colleague called me a novice, a neophyte, and wet behind the ears, but my favorite was the 93-year-old who announced at a council meeting, Jeremy Moss, you don't know anything about anything. I had a great time on the Southfield City Council. But I really did. It was a fun challenge to strategize and push and organized to move my agenda forward. Every day was a fight, and I was very scrappy. And I'm painting this picture because that's who I was when I came to the Michigan legislature in the Michigan House in 2014. In a 47-63 minority, I was ready to fight every day if needed. And one of the first votes that came before the House, this is January or February of 2015, was to change the 2016 Michigan Republican Presidential Caucus, which was paid for by the party, to a Republican presidential primary paid for by the taxpayers. And several of us in the Democratic Caucus thought, what a great issue to push back on. So I came from the caucus room back to the floor, to my seat right here, and I was ready to write and deliver a rousing floor speech, thinking all Dems were prepared to vote no. And then my seatmate turned to me to ask, why do you care? Not everything here has to be a fight. Let them have their primary. Not everything has to be a fight. That went against everything I had experienced on the city council. But it was one of the many lessons that I learned from John Kivala that has made me a better legislator here. I ended up voting for that bill. John and I were from very different parts of the state. His district spanned across one-third of the UP. The 90,000 residents that I represent live in a six-mile by six-mile square. John was amazed that you could park in the middle of my district and be no further than three miles from the bordering districts around me. When he walked doors at the far end of his district, he had to get a motel to spend the night because it was too far to drive back home. And I think that really illustrates the differences between each of our backgrounds here. We all have unique experiences from home that form our values and the decisions that we make to best advocate for the residents that we represent. It doesn't always mean that my analysis is right and yours is wrong or that yours is right and that mine is wrong. John taught me to remember that often. And it's a lesson that has been repeated as I've worked with our speaker-elect, Lee Chatfield although I do think you're wrong quite often. <laughs> when we first arrived here, I think there were a lot of people from my community and a lot of people from your community who didn't want us to work together, let alone become good friends. Instead, we've chosen to find common ground and push our transparency legislation and work on other several bill packages together. 
None of this is to say I've ever compromised my values or backed down from a really good fight. I think John would have joined us yesterday in that really good fight. Uh, I've been gaveled down on the floor before. I've been gaveled down in committee before. Thank you, Chairman Chatfield. But I've also earned the trust to chair a committee. That's right, as a Democrat, I chaired a House Legislative Committee meeting. I'm repeating that twice to ensure that somewhere Al Pasholka hears that. I liken the way we work together, Mr. Speaker-elect, to Wiley Coyote and the sheepdog who clock in and go to battle all day and clock out as friends. The legislature would benefit more if our conflicts were based on policy and not personality. But too often that's not the case. And I think there are still biases in society that are reflected here in government that we need to overcome to enhance policy debates. I've seen these hurdles in action in the 98th legislature and the 99th legislature, and I hope we can begin the work in the 100th legislature to end the institutional bias that stalls good policy. Ending institutional bias. I represent District 35 in, in Oakland County, and it just so happens that District 34 is the city of Flint. So for four years, Sheldon Neely has been a good next door neighbor in the house office building. And when we first got here in January of 2015, he told me that the people in his community couldn't drink the water. It was brown, it had sediment in it. So he wrote a letter to the attorney general. He got no, um, no immediate response. You know the rest. And I often think about what would happen if the people in my community couldn't drink their water. I represent Southfield, a majority African-American city. I also represent communities with some of the wealthiest white Michiganders. How would officials respond if there was a water crisis in Southfield? How would officials respond if there was a water crisis in Franklin or Bingham Farms? How would officials respond to a letter that I wrote versus a letter that Sheldon wrote? And I don't like how I think about how these questions are answered and we have to change that. Thank you, Sheldon, for your advocacy for clean water. Ending institutional bias. Every child in the state of Michigan should receive a quality education regardless of their zip code. That's how we can create a level playing field so that each student has a chance to compete in our economy. I still watch Sherry Gay Danyoga's speech on the floor about discriminatory policies that led to the failures in Detroit public schools. I still get chills from it. When we push for a solution to resolve those issues, we have to listen to the input from those who these challenges directly impact. Thank you, Sherry, for your advocacy for good schools. Ending institutional bias. No one should be fired or denied housing for who they are or who they love, and we must amend the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act to include protections for LGBT Michiganders. But we, have a, we as a community, we face so many other petty challenges on a daily basis. For four years, John Hoadley and I have introduced a resolution to simply declare June as LGBT Pride Month, and every year it dies in committee. Yet we've passed resolutions for Apple Month, Craft Beer Month, Ice Cream Month, Pollinator Week, with no hesitation. A legislature that wants you to know about the contributions of honeybees can surely acknowledge the contributions of gay and trans people, too. We have a lot we can learn from one another about how policy proposals impact those who are different from us. And I will treasure all the friendships I've made on our side of the aisle and the other side of the aisle from people all over the state of Michigan. To Jason Shepard, Dave Maturin, Kim Lasada, Jim Lilly, and Chris Afendoulis, Thank you for being pragmatic. I've always felt like you've listened to my left-leaning point of view with genuine interest. To Daniela Garcia, I don't think you've been interested in my left-leaning point of view, but you've been a good friend. <laughs> to the Republican chairman I've worked with, Joe Graves, Commerce Committee, my first term, I liken you to Dave Rutledge as being a good and decent public servant. To Aaron Miller, Elections Committee, this term, thank you for taking up my bill. To Brant Iden, uh, my chair of Reg Reform as vice chair, we've done a lot of great work together. If any of you are seeking to work on really nonpartisan policy, join the Reg Reform Committee. To Speaker Leonard, uh, every time I've campaigned this fall with and for your opponent, which was often, I always said while stumping for her that I genuinely like Tom Leonard. It probably caused her to go a little harder after you because I wouldn't, but you're a good man 
and you've kept your promise about not having too many late night sessions here, but I guess we'll see where the week leads us. Our side of the aisle, to lead or sing. There have been countless times where you have said or done things and I've thought, I will never be this smart on policy and politics. Thank you for your steady leadership of our caucus and your friendship. To Vanessa Guerra, Vanessa and I were the youngest Democrats during my first term here. We were both the only ones in our 20s, and many times Vanessa and I felt like we were the only ones who could relate to one another. Now it seems like half the caucus somehow is younger than me. Uh, so Vanessa, I'm passing on to you the mantle and responsibility of being the oldest of the youngest, and that means you have to take care of Darren and Abdullah when I'm across the chamber. To Fred Durhal, let's grab a beer at McVee's sometime. To Adam Zemke, let's grab a beer at Necto sometime. To Stephanie, Winnie, Erica, Sylvia, and the other incoming Senate Democrats, I'm looking forward to the march to majority with you in four years. To our House Democratic staff, thank you for your dedication. I know what it's like to be overworked and underpaid here, but you're a critical piece to our fight. To my team over these last four years. Jenny Geese, thank you for helping to establish our office. To Kelsey Heck and Mari Manning, thank you for your dedicated constituent service. To Jason Hoskins, I couldn't do this without you. To Sarah Shilio, good luck. To former senior staff members, Patty Tremblay and Chris Young, you've been invaluable to me. To the policy staff, especially with whom I've worked as vice chair, Rachel Richards and Mitch Albers, who have since left, and Eli Gogish and Jasmine Brown Moreland, I've either been your favorite representative or least favorite representative to work with, so thank you for not letting me know which. To Katie Carey and Samantha Hart, I am sorry I've so tortured your comms team. It's tough to write for somebody who has a journalism degree. I'm sorry for how many times I've mentioned to your team that I have a journalism degree. <laughs> to the press corps, thank you for what you do. I have a journalism degree. <laughs> you are essential to our democracy and I'm working to give you more tools to operate here. To my fellow Oakland County Democrats, Tim Grimal, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you. The House is at a loss due to your term limits. The local Diet Coke market is at a loss due to your term limits. To Jim Ellison, I'm counting on you to be the voice for local governments here. Call out the party of local control when they vote to erode local control. To incoming leader Chris Gregg, you are going to do great things with this caucus and I always have your back. Call me when you need to manage Speaker Chatfield. <laughs> to Robert Wittenberg, I don't, I, you know, honestly, as I was drafting this speech, I didn't even know where to begin to write the words uh, to talk about my partnership with Robert Wittenberg, so I don't have anything written. Um, so it'll come from the heart, I guess. Uh, Robert, you're one of my closest, you are my closest friend here. You're one of my closest friends outside of this chamber. Uh, I know I'm one of your best friends because everybody's one of your best friends. And I just so appreciate everything we've done together uh, over our five and a half years of friendship. I'm so excited to continue to partner with you to represent uh, southeastern Oakland County. Uh, and I know that you're going to do great things, and I got your back. To my parents, Family and friends, thank you for supporting me through this long journey of public service. It's been a collective group effort, and I couldn't do this without your love and sacrifice. And lastly, to the residents of the 35th House District, thank you for continuing to place your trust in me to be your elected representative in government. To Beverly Hills, Bingham Farms, and Franklin, I leave you in the capable hands of State Representative-elect Kyra Harris-Bolden and State Senator-elect Rosemary Bayer. It's been an honor to be your voice in the state legislature these last four years. And to Southfield, my hometown, and Lathrop Village, let's do this, let's go. We're taking this fight to the state senate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.